different from traditional publishers, so we do want to talk a little bit about that. Um, talk about our partnerships that we have in Georgia. Then we'll show you some of Norton's digital learning tools in our initial call with Jeff. Um, we think that in Inquisitive and SmartWork 5 are two great options um, for professors within the um, University of Georgia system. So we'll take you through a demo of that and show you kind of some of the, the features and talk about a little bit of its flexibility and then end on um, integration options. Before we start, though, I just wanted to introduce everyone who is on the call. So Chrissy O'Connor, she is your local representative, and we will um, happily provide her contact information um, at the end of today's call. There's also Katie Corvia, who is the regional manager for the Southeast. Um, Killian Kennedy, who will be doing the um, demo for you today, and I know Lydia Warren is also on the line, who also provides media specialist support for the Southeast. Um, and I'm Cassie Del Pilar, I'm the Director of Norton Affordable Solutions. So we're thrilled to give you an overview, and please feel free to reach out to any of us um, after the call. We're happy to answer any questions, and hopefully we'll have time for questions um, at the end as well. So. With that, I really wanted to go back and just give you a quick introduction about um, who we are. So W.W. Norton is an independent publisher. We've been around since 1923. Um, and if you happen to look at our website or some of our marketing material, um, you'll see independent publishers everywhere. Um, and we're also um, employee owned. And the reason why we like to touch on that is we feel like this corporate structure really allows us to approach um, partnering with universities in, in a really unique way. Um, all the people representing Norton on the call today are all employee owners, and having employee owners as part of the company provides a much kind of different feel of ownership. And whenever you talk to people at Norton, they're extremely passionate about what they do and extremely passionate about the way that they work with professors and try to find good solutions um, for the classroom. But a lot of people ask us, um, that sounds like a great work environment, which is great for those of us who work here, but what does that ultimately mean for students and instructors who work with us um, for course content or digital learning tools? And what it really means, that independent employee-owned status, means that our decisions, particularly about pricing and, and design and content development, are all controlled by employees who have worked with professors um, just like you. We are not controlled by outside shareholders. Anyone who is a shareholder at Norton um, is a Norton employee, and that allows us to be far more flexible on pricing and allows us to uh, maintain the commitment to fair pricing that, um, that many people know us for. So when you do look at standalone prices, for example, we know that a lot of folks um, have charged a, a very high price for their standalone product, and we're very proud that we keep ours reasonable. We can talk about that towards the end. It also allowed us to launch an initiative called the Norton Affordable Solutions Initiative, which is something we started um, a couple years ago um, to form our commitment to fair pricing and flexibility to support all the affordable learning initiatives, particularly ones um, similar to the one that, that is occurring in um, Georgia. So we're very proud of our independent employee status. We own ourselves, and our number one goal is to provide the best learning tools and the best content in a way that really works um, well for the goals that you're trying to achieve um, within your individual classrooms in addition to um, your university. Um, so with that, I am going to let Katie talk a little bit about um, who we currently partner with with Georgia, and then um, after that, Killian will take it away and show you two of the digital learning tools um, that we think could be good options um, for you and your, your colleagues. Okay. Thank you, Cassie. Hi. As Kathy mentioned, I'm Katie. I'm the regional manager for the Southeast, and we definitely have a long history of working with schools in your University of Georgia system. I think personally one of the reasons why people tend to choose us is that they know that they're going to get quality materials at an affordable price, um, and then the service level is always something that they respect about working with us. Most of our reps and people that are in management have been with the company for a long time, so as Kathy mentioned, we're just really invested in trying to do things right. Um, but just, just so you're aware, um, the schools that we work with, I just did a report and, and confirmed we work with every single one of the schools 
that are in your university system. Um, and that, so that's everything from University of Georgia to ABAC, Georgia State, University of West Georgia, North Georgia, and Augusta. And um, we focus specifically on these three areas. We have um, resources and books in the sciences, humanities, and social sciences. And we have digital media to support all of those areas and have subcategories beneath those as well. And um, right now, the majority of our adopters do use either traditional books or ebooks, but over the last two years in Georgia, we've definitely noticed that there's been a shift to look at alternative course materials. And you know, because we've always offered fair pricing as an employee-owned company, unlike some of our other larger competitors, um, we're with you and we, we support the mission that you have, and that's to try to create more affordable solutions to work with students. And so we've actually been um, talking to a lot of professors in the field and administrators about Affordable Learning Georgia and how we can support you. And um, there's one instance of um, an adoption where they're just using um, a digital product of ours completely on its own. They'll begin using it in spring 17, and that's at Augusta University where they are using an um, open source title for introduction to psychology, um, but they recognized that there was something missing in terms of um, quizzing students and getting them to practice with the material before tests. Um, it's just a way for them to feel like they were giving them um, some to students tools to work with before they would assess how they were doing. So um, they use one of our systems, which is an adaptive courseware called Inquisitive that you're going to see. And they are going to be using that standalone as a way to help support um, the mission to try to create an, a more affordable price for students, but also give them something to support them in the course. So that's just one example. And if, um, if you wanted to know about other situations where we are providing support in digital only format, I'd be more than happy to provide those. But I just wanted you to know that we have instances of situations where that's already moving forward and we're supporting your program. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Killian Kennedy. He is a manager at Norton and then also a media specialist to just give you a preview of what Inquisitive looks like for psychology. So Killian, I just gave you presenter privileges. Got it. Let me... Oh, you want to go to share and then either my desktop or application. Oh, you got it. Yeah. Can you guys see that? Yes. Excellent. Just adjust that a little bit. All right, well, thanks again for allowing us to, to join this call today and talk about some of our digital solutions. I do, I'm going to be talking about Inquisitive and also a homework program we have called SmartWork 5. So there are two different resources mainly that I'm going to go over. But while I'm talking about these, if anybody has any questions or would like me to back up and go over something again just to clarify, please feel free to, to fire away. And I'll be more than happy to uh, to answer those. If if and if we we come across something we don't know the answer to, we'll certainly track that down. But the first thing that I want to show you is Inquisitive, and what this is is a formative assessment tool. Formative meaning that the idea here is it is a quizzing engine, and it does present questions and problems for students to work through, but the idea is with Inquisitive is that students learn the concepts while they're working through the problems. So it's not sort of a, a summative assessment tool where you're trying to figure out what a student knows about a particular subject. This is more of a resource for students to work through the problems and actually learn the concepts and get a better understanding of the concepts while they're working through those. And as such, it does have an adaptive piece tied to it to where all the questions are, are tagged with this sort of metadata on the back end, which basically means the questions are tagged to learning objectives or specific concepts. So if a student that didn't know a concept very well started working on an inquisitive activity, if it was a concept they were just struggling with, inquisitive would keep asking them questions related to that concept until the stu student exhibited some mastery or showed knowledge of it, 
and then the system would sort of adapt and then give them questions on other topics. So the long and short of that is, is basically if you think of it as a student that knows the concepts really well, will get through those a lot faster and inquisitive as opposed to maybe a student that doesn't know a concept and is struggling. The system will sort of adapt and then feed them or present them with questions and problems related to those areas where they're struggling. Um, so rather than spend a lot of time talking about the reporting and how this is all set up, I just want to go right into an activity to show you basically what a student would see if they started working an inquisitive activity. Um, and I think as Cassie mentioned and Katie just mentioned a second ago, this is a standalone product. So students can use this sort of in a standalone environment. It's not really tied to anything. But I'm going to go in, I'm looking at an intro to psych course right now for Inquisitive, and I'm going to go into the learning activity. And I'm logged in as an instructor, so I may have a few extra controls visible to me right here that students wouldn't necessarily see. Um, and this little guy over here, if you're curious, this is the mascot. This is Quizmo that appears throughout the system. Um, there's some other funny little uh, cool features that I'll show you in a minute that he's sort of tied with. But the idea here is to make, create an environment where students are, are engaged with the material and, and have sort of a sort of quote unquote friendly environment to learn this material. So I'm going to click on try this activity as a student. And it's basically giving me some information. And this is over the concept of learning. So it's basically telling me how many questions that I need to answer to complete the activity and also that I can gain or lose points on individual questions. And I'll get to that in just a second. But I want to go ahead and start answering questions just as a student would. So if I was a student and I jumped right into this problem, I would see immediately it tells me watch the classical conditioning video experiment and then match the stimuli and responses. So I need to watch the video and then I basically perform matching sort of drag and drop over here. But I'm going to play this just for a second. I won't play the whole thing. The goal for today is to do a demonstration that helps you better understand classical conditioning. Okay? So this is actually a pretty cool one. And this is also closed captioned, by the way. But this is a video where she's basically going to start. She brings a student up to the front of the class. And when she says a specific trigger word, which is the word can, she starts spraying him in the face with water. Um, to exhibit basically it's a demonstration of classical condition. So a student would watch this and then start answering the questions. Now there is some other information over here on the right, but I just want to go ahead and start answering just to give you an idea of how this is set up. So I would say unconditioned response, flinch, and you can see it immediately gives me feedback. So even if I got the, that one correct, it's not just giving me sort of a boilerplate, yes, you got it correct. It's actually telling me why it's correct. So I'm going to grab this one. So I'm getting these right so far. So this, even though this is one problem, it's almost like a mini game within itself or has some of those functions. So there's a lot of interactivity happening, happening here. Anytime I hover over something, I get, you can see the, the color of the, the term changes, there are sound effects, there's also sound playing in the background. I have it turned down right now. So at this point as a student, I'd be doing pretty well. And as you can see, I've got one more to go here. And it tells me good work, gives me specific feedback again. And you'll notice over here on the right that I have an activity score now. So I'm going to go on to the next question. And this is, this is also showing you that there are different question types in here. That had video in, embedded in it, but it was also sort of a matching question, whereas this is a ranking question, where I have to rank these items, put the steps in the order in which they would be introduced and followed by reinforcement. So at this point, if I was a student and I was on this, I might not have been paying attention to what's happening over here on the right, but it's tracking my activity score. So it tells me that I got a 60, or got, I got 60 points on that first problem, but I still don't have a grade. And I'll explain that in just a second, but this again is where it, it, it 
it's trying to get the students engaged and paying more attention to what they're actually doing rather than just going through sort of a rote series of multiple choice questions. So I believe this one's first. And I got all of these right. So my score is up to 120 now. So I'm going to go into the next question. And it tells me, it gives me this little notification that says, you seem to know this content better than you think. You've gotten the last two questions right, but you haven't earned as many points as you could have. And it's essentially telling me that I need to adjust this confidence slider over here. Because for each individual question, I can wager points on whether or not I think that I know the material or if I don't. So this is a good, I mean, this is a really good example of how this would sort of guide a student to pay a little more attention to what they're doing right now. So at this point, I'm going to click OK. And now, I think I'm doing pretty well, so I'm going to raise my confidence slider over here all the way up to 100 points. But it says I can gain or lose up to 100 points. And in this case, I'm going to answer this one. I got it correctly. And I'm going to miss one of these to show you what happens when, as a student, you start to miss one. So at this point, I have 120 points on my activity score. I had the slider all the way up to 100 points. If I get one incorrect, you'll notice it just knocked my activity score way back down. But it says I can gain 50 points back at this point if I answer it correctly. So I'm going to try again. And this is another feature of Inquisitive, and this goes along with the formative assessment piece, is that I don't have an option to give up on this question. I have to keep working through it until I get it correctly. Does anybody have any questions at this point? OK. Yeah, I'm not seeing any here. OK, excellent. So I'm going to move these down and get this one right. And I got 50 points back. So my score went back up just a little bit. And now I have a score of 70. So this is where I want to talk about the scoring just a little bit. So as a student, I've answered three questions, but I still don't have a grade. So down here in the, under the current grade, it says 0%. And it's telling me that I need to answer 17 more questions before I receive a grade. So the way that that works is once a student answers the minimum number of questions required, once I answer 20 questions, a grade will appear over here in the lower right. And based on how many points I've gained on these problems, that grade would either be really strong or it might be really low if I haven't been paying attention to what I'm doing. So to give a little more information or give you a little more context for that, I'm going to click on my activity score here as a student. And as soon as I do that, I can see that it's telling me that I must answer at least 17 more questions in order to receive a grade. And my current score is 70 points. And I'm currently in level one. There are different levels, and those are based on sort of what kind of questions it gives you um, in regard to difficulty or learning objectives. But more importantly, it tells me that I need 430 more points to make to level two, and I still need to get a 100% on this activity, I'll eventually need to get 1,430 points. So that's where the wagering or the confidence slider comes into play with your, your, the amount of points and, and how well you think you know a question before you start to answer the question. So I'm going to go back to questions. And now if I didn't know this one very well, I might want to move this down. So what happens a lot of times is students are working through Inquisitive. They're seeing all these different questions or question types, and they're getting specific feedback. But if they're trying to go through this really quickly, they're not going to be gaining many points over here. So by the time they actually enter the minimum number of questions and they get a grade, that grade might be very low. But the cool thing about Inquisitive is once that happens, and it tells the students, you've now answered 20 questions, this is your grade. It also gives them a note that says, but you do not have to stop now. You can keep going until you get a 100%. So the students usually at that point, if they haven't been paying attention, that's where they slow way down. They pay much more attention to what's actually being asked, 
within the problem, and they pay a lot more attention to the confidence slider over here. So in this one, I'm just going to go through this as if I didn't know it. I just lost points. So now I'm going to pay a little more attention. I'm not doing too well. But I think you get the idea probably of how this is set up. I go on to the next question. And now it tells me that I got the last two questions wrong and I've lost quite a few points. So it's telling me basically to pay a little more attention to maybe not wager as much on the confidence slider up here. And this is an example of a question where they can use their keyboard or they can click on the letters. And I do know the answer to this one, so I'm going to increase this just a little bit. And it gives me some specific feedback, and I move on to the next question. So at this point, I'm getting a little bit better. I'm going to click on my activity score and look at this again. It's telling me that I need to answer at least 15 more questions. Um, one other thing that Inquisitive does that I think is kind of interesting is that if a student is doing really bad and answers, misses a lot of questions incorrectly or, or answers incorrectly, gets a lot of questions wrong one after another, the system will actually stop students and it will force them to take a break. And it plays this game and you see Quizmo pop up and there's actually a timer that they have to play this game before the system allows them back in to keep answering questions. Um, and it says, take a break, clear your mind, take a walk, play a game, do some exercise, which is kind of cool. And um, just one example, this system was developed by a computer programmer who's also a cognitive psychologist. So he built a lot of these features into the system to really try to help students. And at this point, I would say back to questions and I can start up again. And there are a lot of different question types. I mean, I think we've seen um, ranking, identify, there are labeling questions, matching questions, there are questions with video. So there's a lot of variety here too. And one thing that I do want to emphasize really quickly, but before I move away from the scoring and the questions, does anybody have, would anybody, does anybody need more information about this piece of Inquisitive? Okay. So I'm going to back up really quickly, and I do want to point out that, as we mentioned before, this is a this can be a standalone um, resource. And one of the things a lot of people really like about Inquisitive, in addition to to some of the features I just showed you, is the fact that it's really easy to get started with this system as far as the amount of time that's required for instructors to set up a course or start using it, and then for students to get access to it. It's really just a matter of a few clicks. This is the page for Intro to Psych where you would see all your inquisitive activities. And then if you were using this for a course, you would basically set up a student set, which then allows you, it's basically your course, take a couple of clicks, set up your student set, and then you get these options. You'll see to, for each activity, I can just set a due date. And as soon as I set a due date, set grades accepted until, that's basically it. And then if a student arrives at this page, they would just see the activities that have a due date created. Um, because Inquisitive is adaptive, it won't allow you to customize the questions like on a, on a really granular level because they're tagged with metadata that responds to how a student is performing. But you can control how many questions you want in a particular activity and what learning goals or concepts that you want to cover uh, or include or exclude from that particular activity. But for the most part, if you were just starting to use this, you would come to this page, um, create your student set, and then set the due dates right here, as I just did a second ago, and then you would be ready to go. Students could automatically or, or basically very easily get back into this and start take, working through the activities. And one of the ways that, that people use this, that they found this to be really effective, is using it before class. Um, for example, if there are any kinds of assignments or activities 
you require students to do sort of on a regular schedule before they come to class. That's how a lot of instructors are using this, or before they come to lecture, before they come to the online session. They're asking them basically to log in and do the first inquisitive activity, um, which consists usually of 20 questions in order to get a grade. And in that way, they're finding it to be a really effective tool. Um, because again, students can keep working through it until they get a 100%. Um, it's not sort of your more traditional quiz where they're, they're limited or they can give up um, to see solutions. So these are the, the activities that are built for this Intro to Psych course, but you can create your own inquisitive assignments as well, pulling from different learning objectives or from different topics. The other thing that I'll show you really quickly related to inquisitive are the reports. And I have some faux data, as it were, here of students that have worked through this to populate some scores. And now that I've selected that demo data, I can see, for instance, out next to Chapter 7, there's some data here, and it's showing me that there were eight submitted grades. Um, the average time on the activity was 15 minutes, and the average grade was 75%. So that's sort of a macro view. But if I wanted to drill down a little bit, I could select the report option. And this is going to show me, for this particular topic, memory, I can see for this inquisitive activity, I can see the mean questions that were answered. I can see the mean score. I can see the mean submitted grade, and then the mean time spent. And if perhaps you were putting together your own report and you needed some of this data, you can download all of these graphs and all this data as well. So that's looking at how the entire class did, but if I scroll down here, I can see the individual student scores and time spent. So I could click into the details for a specific student if I wanted to see how this student did on this topic of memory. I could click the details next to her name. And then here is the exact information, how she did in regard to the learning objectives, how long she spent. And this is a, a graph of how she did. And it would be really easy for me from here if I needed to override the grades accepted until date or just override her grade or reset the submission. I could basically do that right here with the click of a button. And I got to that again just by looking, because I have instructor access, just by looking at the inquisitive activities and clicking the report button for that individual activity. So this is basically how the students in my class did but if I wanted to see how my students did compared to data that's collected nationally for this particular topic, I could click the learning objectives right here, and it's basically giving me a class activity report on the learning objectives and how my students fared and compared to other students nationally. And this might be data that you want to use or maybe you would never look at it, but it is here and it does capture all this. And I can expand this. And it's basically telling me that any points above this green line indicate questions that um, my students found to be more difficult than other students nationally. And anything below this, they actually did better. So in a really quick snapshot, that's inquisitive. And this does, I'm, I was going to talk about integration a little bit further down the line, but this will integrate with learning management systems. Um, we do this with D2L, Moodle, Blackboard, Canvas, Sakai, quite a few. So are there any questions about Inquisitive? I feel like I've just been talking nonstop here, which I guess I have. Um, I haven't seen any in chat so far, but um, everybody who has any questions, feel free to type them into chat at any time, and I can always bring them up. Excellent, thanks. All right, so this is inquisitive, and now I'm going to switch gears just a little bit, and I'm going to show you something called SmartWork 5. And SmartWork 5 is what I would think of as a more sort of traditional online homework system, whereas with SmartWork 5, 
you can actually do a lot more with question authoring. Um, SmartWork 5, the problems within SmartWork 5 have stricter or sort of more options in regard to policy settings, like if you want to limit the number of attempts a student can have on a problem or if you want to weight certain problems with different point values. And again, you do have more capabilities as far as authoring your own questions and creating your own feedback and then creating basically your own question library. And it does have its own gradebook and its own reporting system as well. So those are sort of the differences and they may be a little bit more evident as soon as I click into one of these. But this is also a, a standalone product and the one that I'm looking at right here is for a geology course. So I'll just You'll notice that this environment looks similar to Inquisitive because it's built on the same platform. Um, so once you're familiar with Inquisitive, this is set up sort of the same way where you would have a course and then you would have all your activities right here and you can also build your own activities. Um, I do have a, a pre-built activity that I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to click on this just to give you an idea what this looks like for a student. And since I'm an instructor, I clicked on the activity. This is my express demo. And it gives me this screen. It's basically showing me for this assignment what questions I have in my assignment and how many, what some of the policy settings are, and then also what types of questions that I've added to this assignment. And I'm going to select Edit Assignment just so I can show you as an instructor if you were using this and you built your own assignment you would have these options. Up at the top, you have your sort of more traditional policy settings where you can give the assignment a different name, create your own name, give it a description, set the grades accepted until date, and there are some additional settings right here where if you wanted to, for instance, put a time limit on one of these, or if you wanted to choose different options with whether or not you want to show the solution, if you provide a solution, and you can also set this up for ungraded practice if you want to, and you've got some other policy settings that are pretty straightforward. But this is also, I'll get back to this in just a second, but this is also the area where you would add more questions to the assignment or create your own. But I'm gonna click the preview option down here to show you what this looks like for a student. So this is what a student would see if they if they hit this. And I didn't have any strict policy settings or a due date set up, but they would see information here regarding grades accepted until dates as well. So I could see it's telling me that none of these have been started, and there's a big button right here that says Begin Assignment. And if I select Begin Assignment, it's going to take me right into that, just as a student would see it. And this is a question that has a video clip in it related to hydrofracking. Um, and it's also showing me, this is the question itself down here, which is a drag and drop style question. Order the steps involved in hydrofracking. So the, the idea here being you would watch the video and then try to answer the question. And you can see at the bottom, there's an indicator here that stays throughout the assignment that tells me how many questions I've completed, and that will start to populate as I move forward, and it tells me I'm on question one of seven, and I can go forward or back if I want to. I can progress in any order. I'll scroll right back up, and then I'm going to go ahead and give this one a shot just to show you how it, this one works for students. And these questions also have hints built into them. So that's something that's a little different as well from Inquisitive. So if I click see the hint, there's some additional information. But now I think I've got this in the right order, so I'm going to submit my answer. And immediately it gives me feedback. And again, this is answer-specific feedback. It's telling me that I got this correct. Now, if I would have gotten that incorrect, I would get similar feedback, but it also tracks my number of attempts. And now that I got it right, it's showing me the solution as well, but it would also 
I would see first attempt, second attempt, third attempt. And if you'd set up your assignment where you're giving your students multiple attempts, it will track all those so they could see how they answered incorrectly before they try it again. And then now down here, you can tell, you can see that it says one of seven questions completed. So I'm going to progress on to the next one. And something else I think I failed to point out about Inquisitive, but it's true for SmartWork 5 as well. These are created in HTML5. So these are tablet compatible. These will work on iPads or tablets. And actually, they both work really well on tablets. So here's another one about hydrofracking. And this is a multiple choice question. But one of the things I want to show in this question, if I click, if I, excuse me, if I click see hint, the hint is actually a video. So I could watch this as a student. Everyone is familiar with the process of melting ice. To and this is also water, closed caption as well. Whether it's an ice cube melting on a tabletop or a mountain lake. No. So for this one, I think I remember the answer uses water. Yeah, and I'm going to submit my answer. And as soon as I do that, it's going to give me once more immediate feedback that I got it correct. And I can click the forward arrow and keep working through this assignment. And that is, in essence, that's what a smart work assignment looks like. And that's what the smart work problems look like. And there are different varieties of problem types as well. I'm just going to back this up really quickly. And I'm in the student view right there. So I'm going to close that tab. And this is back to the instructor view. So I don't want to get too far into the weeds on this, but for this particular assignment, if I was the instructor using this, and maybe I wanted to use some of these questions, but I didn't want to use all of them, and I wanted to delete some, I could do that right here by clicking the X over on the far right. But I could also, if I wanted to add my own questions, I can select Add Questions, and this drops me right into the question library. And this would be really useful if you were building your own questions or you creating your own questions. This is where those would appear. And you would also have the option down here to create a new question. And you can create all, all of the question types we just saw. Um, you have the ability to create all of those. Multiple choice, ranking, labeling, you can do all of that. You can create your own feedback. You can author them all, and then they're stored in the library. And when you create a question, you assign some data points to that. So then when you come back into the library here, you can then filter by the data that you've given it. Or you can filter by type, or if you've assigned a difficulty level, or if you have shared questions, you could go to my questions. Or if you had another library in here, you could filter by those as well. So it's a pretty easy or a really friendly environment to, to not only build your own assignments, to build your own questions as well, or write your own questions. So I'm going to go back to the assignment screen. And I want to show one more thing in relation, excuse me, in relation to SmartWork 5. Um, and that's the reporting that you can see with this system. Um, in this case, I'm going to click on the activity data for this assignment. And then up here, I'm going to choose some demo data to just to show you really quickly what you can see with SmartWork 5. So I clicked on the activity report for this assignment. And I can see right off the bat that it's showing me three pretty useful reports right at the top. Average score on this assignment, percentage of students that completed the assignment, and then also the average time spent on the assignment. And you can expand these if you need to. And then more importantly, right down here at the bottom, or, or towards the lower half, there are three tabs. And these two tabs would probably be the most useful, because there's a Students tab that shows you how the individual students scored on this assignment, and the time spent, and the number of incorrect attempts. And then if I click next to the student's name, I can actually get more information on how this particular student did for this assignment. 
And then I could also, if I needed to edit her grade or change her grade, I could do that from here as well. And I know this probably sounds, seems like I'm throwing a lot of information at you right here, but I think um, the important thing to remember is that this is a really intuitive environment to move around in, uh, both for Inquisitive and SmartWork 5. And the other tab here is the questions tab. So if I just wanted to see how the students did by question for this particular assignment, I've got that data really easily accessible right here as well. So those are the reports, the activity data, as it were, for SmartWork 5. And then setting up the actual assignments or assigning these is very similar to what we were looking at with Inquisitive. You would have a student set here that you create basically just by clicking Create Student Set, giving it a name, and then a start and an end date. And then once you do that, you have these options to either create a new assignment, which would take you into that assignment editor we were just looking at, or you could simply choose the ones you want to assign and then just basically set a date and then select the check mark to publish it. And then any student coming to this page and logging in would see that those assignments that are published and have a grade accepted until date. So, just keep in mind, with Inquisitive, it's more, it's this idea of formative assessment where the students are really trying to learn the concepts in a really engaging environment, whereas with SmartWork 5, we certainly want them to learn the concepts there as well, but this is more, a little bit more rigorous in the way that it handles um, different policy settings or if you want greater control over giving someone what might actually be considered closer to a, a a traditional quiz where they might have limited attempts or you might want greater control over the grades or the ability to author your own content, um, your own questions for an assignment. So those are the two big differences. But really, um, again, in, in a pretty quick overview, that is inquisitive and then that's SmartWork 5. Um, Cassie, did you want to add anything to this? No, I have a couple notes on integration but not the demos. Okay. So I think that's about it. Do you want me to talk a little more about integration right now, or do you want to take that? Um, why don't you go ahead? All right. Well, the way that we set this up is we use a form of integration. We use LTI, um, which is learning tools interoperability, which is basically the non-customized form of LTI where we set up a particular school um, for instance, if the school is using D2L, we work with the D2L admin at that school, and they set us up as what's called a quote-unquote tool provider. And basically, it's a matter of them adding a link to a course, and then we give the, the admin a secret and a key, and, it, and they're able then to make a connection between that D2L system and this platform that we're looking at right here. So once that is complete, we can give instructors a link directly to this page, or we can also provide it in a, a course pack that can be imported right into a D2L course that already has all the links already in there. Um, and there's specific links that are set up for integration, but once you have a link, say for instance, there's a link that just directs right to this page, and once an instructor clicks that link from within her D2L course, the first time she clicks it, she's asked to sign in and then create a student set. And the student set that gets created is then tied to that D2L course from that point on out. So after that happens, which just takes, it can be done in a couple of minutes actually. After that connection is made, then any student that comes to that D2L course and clicks that link, it will allow for single sign-on and gradebook synchronization pass back. So you can send a grade back, which is an average of all of the scores or all the activities completed right here, or you can actually have links to each individual activity that you create, which then those get their own column in the D2L gradebook. Um, it's a really, we just won an award actually from IMS Global, which is an organization that works on some of these open standards for different types of learning management systems. And we just won an award actually for the way that we're using 
integration and LTI um, with Inquisitive and our other digital products like SmartWork 5. Um, and if anybody ever wants to see the D2L firsthand, if you have a, a course shell um, at your school, we can set one of these up so you can see exactly how it works. Any questions about that? Okay, well, I think um, that's just about it. Um, can one uh, shoot the presenter role back to me? I think I can do that. I got it. <laughs> Great. Right. So just to just to summarize Killian's um, explanation of our of our approach to integration. Um, we use a non-customized version of um, LTI, and I do want to emphasize that we're very flexible in terms of how to approach integration at your particular campus. Some folks prefer to send students directly to that um, digital landing page that Killian was navigating from um, navigating from during his demo. Um, other folks prefer that their learning management system is kind of the center of the student experience. So as Killian mentioned, we can provide um, specific links to certain activities so that students log into D2L and then use D2L as the access point for getting into Inquisitive. So it's really flexible in that way. It's not a one, you know, one approach fits all. It's the approach that fits best for your course and fits best um, for the university. Um, and it is available for all of our digital learning tools, um, including Inquisitive and SmartWorks. So uh, there's a lot of different a lot of different choices, and we do it slightly differently at, at each university, just kind of depending on um, how folks use their LMS. We know that, um, for example, like at Augusta, because they're using um, an OAR textbook, um, their preference is to have every all students accessing Inquisitive alongside the material they put together for the course. So by integrating it and using D2L as kind of the main login spot, we're ensuring that students have all their all their course material, you know, not just the Norton tool, but also the tools that the faculty have put together all in one place um, from the very first day of class. Um, so with that, I just want to uh, kind of wrap up and I want to let uh, Christy um, O'Connor, your local rep, um, kind of closed the meeting. Um, but one, one last note in terms of standalone prices for Inquisitive and SmartWork. Um, as Katie said, we want to support your objectives and support your um, affordability initiatives as best as we can. That's why we do provide Inquisitive and SmartWork standalone. Inquisitive standalone is $20, and SmartWork standalone is $35. Um, and we can work with you either to put that in the bookstore or to send students um, to our site. Um, there are lots of different options for that. Um, so with that final note, I will hand it over to Christy, and I'm also going to put her contact information up on the screen. Um, and Christy is the one who works with all of, is the local Nortonian who works with all the professors um, in Georgia. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Um, so as Kathy said, I'm Christy O'Connor, and I work with a lot of schools in the University System of Georgia, Georgia State, University of Georgia, of course, West Georgia, North Georgia, just to name a few. So I actually go out and visit these schools, and I have a lot of really great relationships with instructors at those schools um, and have worked to set up a lot of these digital products um, with the professors there. Uh, we also have LTI at a couple of these schools that I mentioned. So if you have any questions at all about um, what's available in your particular subject area, I'm happy to answer those questions. I'm also um, happy to authorize your access to one of the programs, whether it be Inquisitive or SmartWork, so that you can actually go into the program and not only test the functionality and kind of see how it functions, but also really delve into the content of the questions to really see the time that we've taken to build this quality content. Um, I don't see my contact info on the screen, but I'm going to go ahead and send a message to all participants in the chat box. And you should have my email right there and my cell phone number. It's just K, K O'Connor. Oh, and I typed that wrong. Oh, Kathy's put something up there right now. Um, there we go. K O'Connor at www.norton.com and also my cell phone number. So I would love to hear from you. 
and also just really thank you for your time today. This has been a really great meeting and we hope that you've seen some, some stuff that you find interesting. Well, thank you all for um, presenting today and for all of you for uh, coming to visit and understand uh, what Norton can do for OER implementation and kind of this radical enhancement we're talking about in our new category of textbook transformation grants of uh, adaptive and authoring software. Um, before you go, be sure to go to our form and fill that out to let us know how we did. Uh, this will help us in the future make these events even better. Um, I just put the link into chat because you can't really click the link on the screen. And thank you all for coming. Have a nice, affordable day, and I will uh, see you very soon. And thank you for everybody at Norton for your presentation. Thanks for inviting us, Jeff. Thanks.